This is a companion event to the amazing Brian Stevenson lecture on March 28th. Wow. Yeah. Um, but that was, just not, that was not just one night. Um, our vision and our prayer and our hope is that this will be part of an ongoing transformational conversation across the University of Virginia and across Charlottesville. So that's the context. The topic today is living beloved community, sustaining the soul of, of, of uh, equal justice. Theological horizons, it's in our name. We talk about faith, we talk about theology, and we wanted to take an opportunity to sort of dig into what, what are the faith uh, and the soul sustaining practices and beliefs that equip us to do this work. So a few words of introduction. And as always, feel free. If you have class, you need to leave early. If you get hungry, get more food. This, we're always very chill with uh, movement throughout the room and whatever you need to do. So, so glad you're here. So with that, um, I want to welcome you to this conversation with uh, Reverend Eddie Howard. Thank you. Um, he is a local hero and the author of Still Convicted, A Story of Redemption, Reconciliation, and Restoration. We have free copies of this book, thanks to Eddie, um, at the table there. I hope especially students will pick this up, um, or adults, you are also welcome to copies. Um, and I know uh, we have a lot to talk about, but just a few words. Um, Eddie Howard is a Charlottesville native. And I had the privilege of meeting Reverend Howard in the early 2000s when uh, he was in his first season on the staff mm -hmm. at Abundant Life, in Charlottesville Abundant Life Ministries, yes. located in the Prospect neighborhood of his childhood, yes. which is so powerful. When Eddie moved to Virginia Beach, he uh, was a business owner who continued in the vocations of pastoring and mentoring with a focus on promoting literacy and supporting fathers. Reverend Howard returned to Charlottesville in 2021 to serve as the executive director of Charlottesville Abundant Life Ministries, where he is known for his deep relationships with the community, his wise leadership, and his extensive personal experience in peace building and restorative justice practices. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank oh, you. yay. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited about this conversation. So we've got until two o'clock, so we have about um, 40 minutes to really dig in together. Um, this book that you wrote, Eddie, you dedicated, you wrote it in 2015. Yes. And you um, dedicated it to your mother, yes. Vivian Meads. Yes. And you say that her last words to you were, Reverend Eddie, I am proud of you. Yes. If she were here with us today, what would she tell us about your story and about you? She would say, it was a long journey. <laughs> My mother followed me all over the state of Virginia as I went to different institutions. And she was always there. She was always positive. She was always supportive. She would always tell me this story when I was a little boy and I would come home from church, and my granddad owned a shoe shop in Crozet, and so he sold sodas and the little Coke boxes. She said, every Sunday you would come home, you would get up on that box, and you would preach what the preacher preached. <laughs> so how I got from there to just, you know, living a loose life, uh, and to be honest with you, uh, once I was old enough to leave the church, I left because the God I knew at that time, I didn't have, I didn't want anything to do with him. I didn't want the God that I couldn't go to the bathroom in church. I had to sit still. I couldn't move around and I get popped up beside my head. You know, they would take my little candy. I snuck into church. So I didn't want no parts of that God because I thought that God was a disciplinary God. And I was always going to be on the backside of discipline. And I walked away from the church. You know, and I walked away from the church not realizing that I walked away angry with God. And my life was in that direction, like God is in my rearview mirror and I can't drive looking backwards. And so, you know, in and out of trouble, in and out of jail. Listen, I have 66 charges on my record. I'll give you time to take a breath. <laughs> And on that last charge, there's a man here today 
His name is Judge J. Sweat. And he looked at me and he said to me, Eddie, I'm going to give you a break that I think you never had. But if, and I was facing life in 40 years. And he said, if you come back in my courtroom, I'm going to give you all of it. And Judge Sweat and I, we became friends. We used to do banquets for the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry together. And he's sitting back in that corner right there the day. Raise your yes. hand, yes. please. Yes. No. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my journey of restoration and reconciliation and understanding what beloved community look like. And I shared with Karen earlier, when we look at beloved community, we kind of compartmentalize it and we want to see it right here. And I can go all the way back to 24 years ago and say this beloved community started right there. We've been knowing each other 18 years. Great friend. Karen and Charles have been great friends. I mean, that was, as no phone call. I couldn't, I, I could call them. I, I count on the privilege to be able to call Karen Marsh and Charles Marsh and get them on the phone. And, you know, and, and that's beloved community. And they, and they walked along beside me and they encouraged me when I was working for the ministry. I came out fresh out of the penitentiary. No clue with what I was going to do with my life. And I used to go down there and clean up on the outside. And I was asked one day, like, well, you stay at the ministry more than I do. Would you like a job? And so, you know, and, and I wasn't quite sure. Because, see, this is what I thought church was. You go to Sunday school on Sunday. You listen to the pastor preach. And you go back to Bible study on Wednesday. And you did your Christian duty. And I was like, well, if that's all to it, then... You know, and so and so beginning to understand uh, what my walk in Christ looked like. And to be honest, if it was not for Abundant Life Ministries, I wouldn't be sure where I would be at today. So when you ask about my mother, mm -hmm. you know, I think her first statement would, I think she would look up and she would say to God, well done. Mm -hmm. That's the journey I took her on. Mm -hmm. She would say to God, well done. And then she would look at me and say, and you better get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Sounds like a good mother. Thank you. I'm so glad yeah. we can honor her together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another person who loves you, John Keese, who oh. we knew as an undergraduate. He's now a professor of religion at Loyola. He writes that you are a tireless advocate for the marginalized and the excluded, yeah. touching the lives of countless individuals through your remarkable story of transformation. Why have you chosen to talk about your personal experiences with so much vulnerability and transparency? Because a guy named John Keese taught me how to be transparent. Here's this young, yuppie white kid out of Boston, Massachusetts, going to the University of Virginia, walking through our neighborhood, looking at addresses, and I'm standing in the door and go, do this white boy know where he at? <laughs> and so I opened the door and we meet and he come in the house and we became the best of friends. Uh, we walked the streets together. He used to babysit my children. You know, I took advantage you, of that you friendship. You babysit my children too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> so, 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 you know, I, I just feel like my story is personal because it's not just my story. It's the story of many guys just like me that go to jail, penitentiary, come out, and they're standing there, and they're trying to figure it out. And as I wrote in the book, there are so many things grappling at us. The parole officer is saying, I need you here every week. The guy that finally gave me a job saying, you better not miss one hour. Uh, the, my parents are saying, okay, I need you in the house at a certain time. And so there's all these things grappling at you and you trying to check all the boxes and you trying to figure it out. And then they say, hey, you can't hang out with this person and you can't go there over here and hang out. It was called solar zones then. And you can't hang, well, the only people I knew was those that was out in the street doing what they not supposed to do. Yeah. 
But a band of us met in the jail and we began to fellowship together and we began to pray together and we begin to trust God for things and, and talk about, you know, where we was at. And so telling this story, uh, Karen, again, is not just my story. It's the story of many men and women all over the world, but this nation in particular, the highest incarcerated country in the world, you know? So I feel telling this story well, well, help the next guy or help the next girl or help that person that don't understand uh, a, a, a young lady or a guy coming out of penitentiary and what their struggles really are. Because we have many struggles. We, first, we may be homeless when we come out. And then we had a system requiring all these things. Go to Region 10, get this examination. Hey, boss, I got to take off. You take off one more day. But I got to go see my parole officer on Friday. Mm -hmm. So there are so many obstacles out there. So telling that story for me, again, is hopefully helping open up eyes, but also help people in my position see there is hope. Mm -hmm. And that hope is in Christ. The Bible says if any man be in Christ Jesus, that's a personal, that's a personal moment. That's not a corporate moment. Mm -hmm. I was like, God, when you said any man, old thing, you mean I'm not accountable? I mean, I really can do something different. I didn't know what else to do. I, all I knew was the streets. I knew how to sell drugs, you know. I knew how to, you know, run women. Uh, I, and I knew how to do all these things, but I didn't know how to be whole in Christ. And when he told me I could be, that was my eye-opening moment. Like, me? Really? I just remember I told you all earlier, 66 charges. Understand this, I should be doing that life sentence right now. A career criminal. But God sent somebody in my way. And he didn't have faith in me. He had faith in the God he served to do the right thing. Well, I don't know if it was the right thing at the time, but I can say today is the right thing, <laughs> you know? And that's what it's all about. And when you talk beloved, so it's not just my personal experience. Karen, I met you and Charles. I mean, we, we are friends. We are like friends. This is my friend friend, <laughs> you know? I, listen, and I don't, and listen, and I don't say that lightly. I don't say that lightly. 18 years we've been, or a little old, that we've been yeah. knowing each other. Jesus talked about them friendships. Greater love. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about. That's what the beloved community is all about. Seeing the things that God has done in your life. And the other piece is, when you walk into a space, you come into a space, do you leave this space better when you leave out than what it was when you came in? And that's what it's all about. Yeah, amen to that. Well, um, when Maggie and Rosberg and I met with you back a couple months ago to talk about this topic, um, sustaining the soul of um, equal justice, um, to every question I asked you, you responded with scripture, which is what you just <laughs> did. So you took my next question, but oh, I'm gonna read that verse again. Yeah, go right here. Because I really love that you've given us these scriptures, we've printed them off for, for all of you. You can take these, these verses with you, these Bible stories. Um, just to explore, uh, hear from you again, what these verses mean to you. This verse from 2 Corinthians 5, mm -hmm. 17. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Mm -hmm. The old has gone. Mm -hmm. The new is here. Um, where do you see, let's talk about Charlottesville for a minute. Where mm -hmm. might the old be going and the new coming? What, do you, what glimpses of new life do you see? I see hope because of space like this. I see hope because of events like Brian Stevens. I see hope because of uh, festivals like Tom Tom. I see hope because of the people that God have put in my life and, 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 that, and that move forward, that we move forward together. And, and, and it's my hope and your hope and your hope and your hope that we can see a brighter tomorrow for Charlottesville. You know, we look at the past and we learn from it. You know, and we don't judge each other by the past. We use that. Even the Bible tells us the Old Testament was written 
for us to learn from. So, so history has been written. So what do we de do next? I was, talking to, I was talking to Mr. Diggison over there earlier, uh, who I was raised up with in the Prospect Avenue community. Mm. And, and so he, he yeah, and so he, he knows some of my exploits, okay? <laughs> it is he, a small town. He, yeah, and, well, he know the ones I'm not telling you all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, vul tr vulnerability does not have to mean everything. That's right, that's right. And, 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 and so when we go forward, you know, if we catch hold of the vision of what beloved is, beloved is not a concept. Beloved community should be our reality in the now. And we see it as our reality in the now. We can move forward in that. And we see ourselves as one. We see the oneness of God as we look at each other. You know, I had somebody say, oh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, pay, I don't pay attention to skin color. And I was like, you don't? You mean you look over my uniqueness? Like, what you talking about? I'm, a, I'm unique in my own skin, so please don't pass that by, you know. Yeah. You know? But, but, but being able to have a conversation like that and being able to, to approach that conversation in the most beloved way that we can, that's my hope for the future of Charlottesville. Listen, I came back to Charlottesville because of a community I love. If I didn't have hope in it, I was retired in Virginia Beach riding my jet ski, Kern. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I do, there is hope. But, but here's the hope right here. As we gather and as we listen to one another and as we bring our own energy to the space, you know, I work for a ministry. That's hope. And I tell people, you know, they're like, well, you work for a ministry, yeah. especially when I'm out there trying to get money, right? Oh, you're a religious organization. I say, oh, you don't know church. I said, no, we're not a church. Mm -hmm. You know, this is who we are. But that is what we do because of who we are. We're not trying to proselytize nobody. We're trying to offer the hope of the beloved community. And we doesn't matter if you saved or you're not saved, you know. I can give you my personal opinion about how that should go, but mm -hmm. yeah. it's not my personal opinion. It's what God says. All men created equal according to God. He created everybody according to God. That's the beloved community. That's the real hope. One nation, one tongue. And that's what it's all about, Karen. Amen. Well, you are known for your grace and your generosity. And um, I'm so grateful, of course, for you just giving us that vision wow. and, and holding hope we can borrow from you. Um, and I would love to know, we've talked about peace building, we've talked about restorative justice process. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us kind of some of the nuts and bolts of how that mm -hmm. has been a part of your life, that work? Wow. What exactly your yeah. engagements have been, especially for students who are super inspired and fired up about Brian Stevens and, you know, what yeah. are next steps? Yeah. How have yeah. you pursued peace yeah. building and um, restorative justice? What is that? How have you done it? It start with me. I have a saying, I cannot see inequality unless I'm looking out of the eyes of equality. And the restorative process is about that. It's being able to look that person in the eye and see yourself. And when I see myself, I can offer that person an avenue to begin to, to, to walk with me and walk through the things that are holding them back when it comes to the restorative process. You know, there's a, there's, there's a system in place. And, and I've been doing the restorative justice work since, since Virginia restorative justice years ago. And so being a part of that and, and being a part of watching people, uh, victims and offenders want to come together and want to kind of talk about it and hearing each other and, and, and understanding, a victim understanding uh, a offender approach like this particular way and then watch them when it's over with. Stand up, hug, embrace, cry together, forgive one another. That's what the restorative process is all about for me. When, when, I, can, when I can go down in, in, in my community and I can talk to a family and I can say, hey, this is how you can you know, get through this and we can work together and 
create a system that that's going to restore that wholeness to a family. You know, whether a dad uh, got in trouble, or a mother got in trouble, or something happened with the kids. You know, you think about all the shooting that's going on. One of the families that we ministered to, we went there. The grandmother came. Hey, can you come pray for us? Can you can you can you do this? And we look in that knees, and that's part of the restorative process. Meeting them where they at. You know. Uh, when you talk about equal justice, Karen, I think about that. And, you know, a lot of time we put, you know, equal justice as, you know, everybody need to have the same amount of everything. Well, that is really not equal justice. Equal justice, when you look at it in the word, God gave each one a talent according to their ability to use that talent. And that's what equal justice look like. According to your ability. You have an ability and a gift that I don't have. And it, I would be crazy to say, oh, God, I need what you gave Karen. Because it's not made up like that. Hmm. You know, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm always saying, okay, and it never, never end a sentence with a proposition. Well, I don't even know what a proposition is. <laughs> that's an, that's an old rule. Right, 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 right. You know, never start a sentence with an end. Well, that's not me. So accept me right here. You know, and, 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 and I, I accept, you know, the academia side where they are. That's why I need friends like Karen Marsh that's looking at live theology. That's in the now. And I tell, and I tell my staff, I tell families, we are still writing the gospel. We, we are still writing epistles. And in the years to come, our story will be told. And that's what it's all about. That's what the restorative process is all about. That's what the redemptive process is all about. Because our epistle will be our legacy. Charlottesville, what is Charlottesville, what is the legacy gonna be 30 years from now? How, how, how will my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids, how will they see and view Charlottesville? And what do I leave to them? What, what do I bring to the table today that they're going to be able to walk in that equality tomorrow? And so I offer what I have, and you offer what you have. Mike, you offer what you have. You know, I got a lot of friends in here. So, yes, you do. You know. yes. And then my staff here, they, they waiting on me. Yeah, I love that. Well, yeah. it's just so beautiful that you brought, brought them as just testimony to the powerful work you're doing at Abundant well, Life and your you. commitment to, to Charlottesville. Thank you. Here's another verse for you that you gave to me, Lamentations 3, 22 to 24. I'll read it out. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. What in this passage has sustained your soul toward justice? Every morning I wake up, I let God know that I know I have no clue. He has to direct me every morning. Now, I have a lot of ideas how I want my day to go, you know. And, and his mercies is new every morning. When I get before him in the mornings, what I do understand is, again, I just said that, he know my portion. He understand who I am. And he's going to give me, and you all, what you can handle. And, and that's what that means to me. And I know if I, if I put him in front every morning. I, listen, I'm executive director of a ministry again. I, when, I, listen, I walked into this job, I, I executive director, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a dad. That, you know, I'm trying to be a husband. And, and I walked into this job with a heart to serve the community. But what I do know, every morning, morning by morning, when I get before him, he's going to give me direction. He's going to help me understand what to do and how to do it. You know, I believe those he called, he equipped. And so I have to depend on him. And that's what that means to me, you know, with the ministry, with the community, with my, with my wife, with my children. Morning by morning, his mercies is new. And I have to put that before him every morning. That I understand your mercies is new every morning, God. Yeah. Well, I think for students here who are thinking 
aspirationally about what they'd like to do with their lives. This is such a good word, you know, every morning. Yeah. This is how this is how you've sustained this yeah. incredible witness of yours. Um, the final verse, are, it's actually a gospel story from the chapter, uh, fourth chapter of Mark. And I'm going to ask you, where is the restorative justice in this verse? Are you ready for the story? Um, all right. Because you gave me this passage, and I'm curious to know how it fits with the okay. topic. Okay. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Talk to us about this story. Well, I'm always reminded, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. If Jesus said we're going to the other side, mm -hmm. we have no choice but to get there. Let me say that again. He said, let us go to the other side. Nothing would have stopped that mission. Even that storm that rose up in the middle of the sea, Jesus knew that storm was coming. But here's a restorative part of this. You talk about Charlottesville. Jesus saw the future of that journey because that was a man waiting on that bank just for Jesus to heal, just for Jesus to restore back to society. <laughs> Just for Jesus to speak into his life, watch this, Karen, so he could send him to Charlottesville to tell everybody who did that for him. Mm. Wow. That's the restorative process in that. Mm -hmm. Jesus, one man, one man, a whole city. Amazing. Because wow. he wanted to go with Jesus, remember? Yeah. He, yeah, he wanted to go with Jesus. He said, no, 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 that's not your mission. We talk about gifts. We talk about talents. Yeah. Going with me is not it. I need you to go back to the city you came from. Yeah. So they have an understanding of what my expectations are. Yeah. That's the restorative process. Amen. This is why it's Reverend Eddie Howard. <laughs> <laughs> He's preaching well, I don't know. well, I want to give time to all of you. I've, asked, I've had loads of questions, but Christy has got a microphone, and we're going to let Christy um, give it as she wishes for questions. Uh, I've known Eddie over 50 years, and we grew up together. This, this is the most incredible thing, man. This is, but your willingness to speak truth to power, and God's grace and mercy is a story for, for generations. And what you're doing in the city, in our old neighborhood, my old neighborhood, you're saving souls and saving lives. And I want to thank you. I just want to thank you, Eddie, for, thank for you. what you're doing, and bless you. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Sarah Peasley, and I'm a little late here, um, but we just completed the restorative justice program uh, here in Charlottesville through the uh, Commonwealth Attorney Office, mm -hmm. and that um, it, it, was an, it was an incredible, transforming, somewhat experience. And I and my family, we did it on our own, not with any Jesus or any mm -hmm. God. We just sat there and listened and shared and went around and around. And I really hear what you say that it, we each have our own gifts. Because at first, I, I'm a pretty impatient person. And I really wanted things to change so uh, we could prevent other accidents. And I wanted the, the perpetrator to do, hurry up and do something about it now. But through the process, I really, I had the experience of how much pain he suffered and how hard it was 
for him to move forward. And it took a long time, but gradually we came through. Awesome. So I just want to support restorative justice in whatever form. Jesus, God, or on your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Can, can, yeah. I, I, and, and I want to speak to that. Uh, as a Christian, practicing Christian, and, and, that's, and that's okay. God called Cyrus his anointed. He was a heathen. God say, I appointed firm for such a time as this. So God don't have a respect of a person. So, and that's why I say to people, don't allow my belief to deter you from the journey that God put you on. Because sometimes we'll get it tangled up and we don't know how to get it unloose. So, so regardless, you know, of what your belief system is, find out what your gifting are. Find out what your talents are then move forward because we we will kind of stay right there that I am or I am not whatever it, and 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 moving past that is what happened within the beloved community we move past that and we move forward so I just want well, to my, my new talent is supporting restorative justice awesome <laughs> Thank you. Um, I founded a. I founded the Black History Academy. I just want to show you that. Actually, I just founded that. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm a local, whatever I am, <laughs> teacher, <laughs> artist, <laughs> person, <laughs> old friend of Sarah's since I was a child. Um, I guess I've been having a lot of support from this group and also just in general in my life about my personal spiritual uh, crisis is one way to put it. Um, I've been practicing Nichiren Buddhism for 37 years, the Namiho Renge Kyo one, and um, uh, Brian Stevenson had such an impact on me that I consciously ceased my Buddhist practice on March 28, and I've had a journey from then till now. I was supposed to be in Montana right now, but I'm very glad I'm not. <laughs> and so I guess I'm kind of like, feeling myself kind of picking up the Buddha train a little bit now and sort of piggybacking on, you know, Sarah is Sarah, she has her path, I'm me, I have my path. I would love to hear your response to somebody who's been kind of practicing two things for 10 years and having a lot of messed upness, including that. I would say welcome to the real world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I used to practice five percent. I used to read the Quran, uh, you know, as a Christian, because I was curious, uh, and I just wanted, you know, to make sure that I'm on my right path, you know. And so again, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people here can relate to the fact that. You know, kind of, okay, am I over here, over there? What path do I take? And that's okay because it's not my job to speak to the direction you should be going in or anyone in here. I can share my faith and I can give you that and then I can let you glean from that and then from that, you can ask God, how do I move forward? So, you know, I, I just don't believe there's no one answer. There's one answer for me, but I don't believe there's one answer for the multitude of people who are seeking. So, yeah. Eddie, um, you know, you've, you've come back to be involved in the ministry of abundant life and purposely move back into the community where you and Richard grew up. And um, I guess the question I would ask, especially with students here, uh, as they're exhibiting their faith, as you're exhibiting your faith in your neighborhood with people that have known you your whole life and know mm -hmm. the backstory mm -hmm. as well as the mm -hmm. gospel story, 
Um, talk a little bit about, for these folks, how do they walk that in going home after exams with their family or being back with their friends and, you know, they've, they've listened to Brian Stevenson or hearing these different things and, mm -hmm. and they want to just go home and throw up, over, throw up everybody, you know, mm -hmm. to get people to understand. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit, give these folks some advice in regards to how to walk it in their families because, you know, as we know, Jesus mm -hmm. even had mm -hmm. a, a hard time in his own hometown. Absolutely. Jesus stayed his authentic self. And not once did you see him try to push himself on people. He was inviting. He had a spirit of humility about himself. He wasn't charging into people. When I'm in my community, people know who I am. They know my walk today. They know my walk from yesterday. And they embrace what I represent because I'm not pushing it at them. They embrace what I represent because I come saying, how can I help? What needs can, can we meet you in? Uh, how can we help you move forward in the wholeness of, of who you really are, not in the brokenness that you live in there? So I would say to you, when you go back home, hearing Brian Stevenson, look around. See where you fit. And, 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 and continue to walk in your own authentic self. Because, according to Eddie, the worst thing you could do is start preaching to people. I am Reverend Eddie Howard, but my staff would tell you I'm I just share my wisdom. And, and that's how we move. When they have an issue with a parent or, or a student, uh, you know, they'll come. And I was like, just be yourself, knock on the door, tell them what it looked like, you know, listen to that two minutes of they don't want to hear it, and then they'll hear it. And, and, and that's how we move forward, not trying to push, you know, but again, finding where you fit in your gift, find where your gift fit, find where your talent fit. And walk in that when you go back home. You know, you heard Brian Stevenson, and you heard his work. Well, listen, his work was his work. And he just shared how God used him to help people. And that's the piece we have to take in also. He did great works. And, he, and I don't believe he came to push us forward. I think he came to give us that information so Charlottesville and students, you can decide how to distribute that information and how to move forward because your walk going to speak louder than anything you can say. So that's what I would encourage you to do. And then if that fire burning real, real hard, um, talk to Kern. <laughs> well, I'll send you to Eddie Howard. So I think that's a good last word. Thank you, Eddie. Well, oh, thank my goodness. You. Um, yeah, let's thank Eddie Howard. Um, and again, this is part of an ongoing conversation. It's such a beautiful thing to introduce you um, to some of the younger ones here and for you to be with friends who have been such an important part of your life and you're such a important part of mine and Charles's. Um, a couple things that I want to share with you. Um, we have a couple of different resources from Theological Horizons. If you'll go back to our website, theologicalhorizons.org, and check out the Scoper lecture page, you can look at all of the community partners. We had more than 50 community partners. If you're looking for a way to plug in and get involved, Abundant Life is, is one of our sponsors as well. Um, and Grace and Manuel, would you come up one second? Um, one way to look at Abundant Life is on the website, but you have an actual like physical opportunity to see Eddie and his team in action and make a difference. Come, you, I'm, oh, Christy's got the mic? Okay, good. Tell us what's coming up, fellows. Mm -hmm. um, who you are, what you are. Okay, um, my name is Mingut Ababa, and I'm a second year at UVA. I'm also a Perkins Fellow through Theology of Horizons, which means we have a community partner, mine is Abundant Life, and we have conversations regarding social justice and faith at, at the intersection and how do we serve Charlottesville better, and that's where we go and volunteer. 
Yeah, I mean, basically the same thing. I'm Grace. I'm also a Perkins <laughs> Fellow with Abundant Life. And yeah, I don't really have anything to add. But I can tell you about next Saturday, so not tomorrow, but the next one, there's going to be like just a little service day situation at Abundant Life. And we're going to be doing yard work from 10 till 2, if anyone wants to come. Christy, I think we'll be emailing out more information about that. But it should be a good time. And we'll get to learn more about Abundant Life and just be there with the community. And it'll be a great time, as always, at Abundant Life. So 10 until? 12. 12. I think. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. that. Right? Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> students join up. Um, adults, you're good with shovels and things, I'll bet. So, everybody come. This is a great opportunity to be a part of the work, literally um, part of the work at Abundant Life. Yeah. Um, we have also um, printed out two of our resources um, for you to take with you. It's one thing to see it online. We have the PDFs, but we really invite you to take these. They're at the table. One is a piece that Maggie Rosberg with, with mm -hmm. Eddie Howard created on sustaining the soul of equal justice. It's uh, three pages. We have um, words from Brian Stevenson. We have words from uh, Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab, a Lutheran Palestinian theologian about hope. We have a prayer from Black Liturgies by Cole Arthur Riley. We have a moment to reflect from Eddie Howard and a piece from Henry Nowen on the art of waiting. And then some questions for reflection and some space for notes. So I hope today, after you'll take this with you and you'll just spend some time really absorbing this conversation and asking God, uh, asking yourself, you know, what are the next steps? Um, another piece we have for you is called Looking Forward, Steps for Further Learning and Action. You'll find here pieces to read. Uh, one is an article about Charlottesville Unite the Right that EJI, Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson's organization put together. Uh, videos you can watch, experiences. Uh, there's a trip, of course, to the civil rights um, locations that Charlottesville residents are going on. So you can take a trip, you can donate, you can volunteer. So again, we don't want you to leave without a lot of opportunities to take next steps and learn more. And finally, on Sunday, our sponsor and community partner, St. Paul's Memorial Church, is hosting Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings of Yale Divinity School. He's gonna be speaking on dismantling racial faith. He's gonna preach on Sunday morning and then speak at 4.30 for this Koinonia lecture, a Sunday, April 16th, that's two days. So again, you'll find that here on the table and at the at the table as you leave, and I hope you'll learn, uh, again, a sort of a theological academic take on this subject. So lots to learn, um, mm. lots to participate in, but mostly um, lots of soul nourishing time yeah. we've had. Thank you, Eddie, Thank you. we're so grateful Thank for you. all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody for coming out and being yeah. a part of this great event that Theological Horizon have put on. Yeah. So, well, we've recorded you. it thanks to Drew Precious, our amazing videographer and photographer, so mm -hmm. you can share this with friends. Thanks, Drew. <laughs> and we always end with a blessing. May the Lord Christ go with you mm -hmm. wherever he may send you. Mm -hmm. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace and eat more food. Amen. Amen.